So unless Peter wants to correct me, my understanding is Peter's um, hugely significant in TV. He uh, founded Tiger Aspect back in the 1980s. At around about the same time, he founded a talent agency, um, sold Tiger Aspect in, I think, 2011, um, uh, but really has helped shape the way we see TV and made some amazing television and some uh, incredible films. Uh, so this is kind of about his experience and how he ended up doing what he does and what's involved in what he does. I'm, I'm intrigued to know how a talent agency runs, so I will be probing Peter about that. Is that fair? Is that actually enough? Yeah, that can cover it for now. Yeah. <laughs> um, so Peter, you are best known for um, TV and film through Tiger Aspect. Um, but it was theatre that sort of put you on that path when you went away to university, you went to Cambridge. So explain how, how that kind of led you to where you are now. Well, to start off with, thanks for coming out on this sunny evening. I told John I'm not box office and I never wanted to be box office. I'm very <laughs> impressed that everybody had such a glorious evening. Um, so uh, thanks for that. Well, uh, and it's relevant I'm not box office because I've always liked working behind the scenes in any of these disciplines, really. And I was brought up in Liverpool in the 60s, went away to school, but still Liverpool was a very culturally vibrant place to be. Uh, and not, not only do you have the, obviously the whole Beatles thing going on, but the whole place with the Liverpool Everyman and the Playhouse and my uh, sort of uh, Perry nanny lady went out with Willie Russell. You know, he was the boyfriend. And so it was a very, and it was a world I wanted, I was attracted to and went to the theatre a lot uh, in Terralia. And, uh, and then when I got to university, I went to a very academic school and, a long way from home, so I thought, where were the Rishi Shunak school, no less. And um, and I thought, I'm just going to bite the bullet and try and get involved with theatre at Cambridge. And you've got a big train set to play with. And I got involved with some very talented people in a way that's, I always consider myself being extremely lucky. But you make, to a degree, you make your own luck by attaching yourself to very talented people who need what you do. So I just, um, I got involved with running this regular theatre there, and you have an own the theatre to run as students. You run the whole thing. Is this the Footlights? No, it's called the AD, That's called the Amateur Dramatic Club. Footlight was just a club, and you do Edinburgh Edinburgh Festival, which I went to, and I had with a show with a guy called Jimmy Mulville, who set up Hattrick Productions. Nick Heitner, you know, who runs a bridge now around the National Theatre with great esteem, uh, and uh, so. It seemed more fun. I read law and I thought, well, this could be more bit of crack than, uh, <laughs> than a proper job, as it were. And my father, I remember my father saying, you know, if you need any support, just go and do it. Because I got offered by this mate of mine had been a boxer called Andre Tuszynski to uh, match up with him when I was leaving university to take these Shakespeare shows around America with a bunch of recent graduates. It's called the Oxford Came to Shakespeare Company, but we auditioned at the uh, National Student Drama Festival and ran about. And funny enough, I was I'm just having my office redone at the moment. And this very day, I was looking, I was turfing stuff out, and I found these fantastic photographs of Rick Mail, <laughs> who was in one of these shows. Most wonderful, charming, talented man. So um, awesome. anyway, I'll, I'll pass them around. Yeah, they're just, and Ben Elton, but it's Rick who was the... It was a really good buddy in those days. Me. And, um, so was this how, how far ahead of the Gosh Rick Mill and Ben Elton sold out? Yeah, so that's how, early eighties, that is. So yeah. how how um when when you were together, how, how far ahead of the young ones and how far uh, how far well, Rick Mill was coming out? That sort of, it was before the young ones, but then it grew into that. Um yeah, I used to do his touring. So and I think theatre's still amazing uh we're very good at it in this country, as we are with a lot of these arts. But I think, you know, we're consistently brilliant at producing actors, directors, writers. Just reading yet another play by Jack Thorne being reviewed today. I can't believe he keeps writing so many, but I just saw another one, the Mark, the, uh, uh, the, Mar the, what's it called, in the queue, the motive in the queue. But anyway, so I've always loved that, and that's what we did for a few years. But it's a very precarious business, theatre production. And is Edinburgh where you first met Rowan Atkinson? Yeah, I was doing a show in 1976 with these guys, you know, with uh, 
Originally, Douglas Adams had directed it for the May Week Review version, and it ran at three hours 40. And that was and for Edinburgh, you have to knock your shows down to an hour, and Douglas was incapable of doing that. So I had the great you know, temerity, you know, he was a bit older than me as well, it was actually three years of the day, I had to fire Douglas and replace him with Griff Rees Jones, who got it down to an hour. But then we had the show at nine o'clock, and at 10.30, it was the Oxford Review, and I used to stay and watch that occasionally. And that was Rowan Atkinson and Richard Curtis. And I thought, God, we're good, but these guys are even better. So I grabbed hold of the cocktails and never let go. <laughs> and what an amazing alliance that turned out to be. Um, so you set up Tiger Aspect in 1988, I think, something like that. Um, and at that time, maybe it's worth thinking about the context in which it was set up, because Channel 4 had started in 1982. Sky was about to launch in the UK and then we got we got Channel 5 I think in 97 so it was a, a time of, of I think we felt at the time quite big change nothing in comparison to the number of channels we have now but did that feel like a, a time of opportunity for making television? Yeah I mean in a way it's again it's being in the right place at the right time which is lucky that there it was the independent sector was just in its infancy but there were opportunities and then it's slowly they had some obligation to make a percentage initially instigated so we did a lot of you know there was a lot of lobbying going around government to make that uh, happen but it did open up and particularly and there was a real I mean it actually set up the tiger thing with Rome initially to own Mr Bean which because you know he and they were in Rome in a very prescient way he says British music sells all around the world why can't we do something with this comedy character that we've got and we actually tried it out to do television versions in the Oxford Playhouse. I rented the Oxford Playhouse for a few days without audiences, just playing around, and then an audience at the end, and um, turned this stage character into a television character. And it turned to be a very, a very good move. Because he became a film character, and now he's a cartoon character. Yeah, it kind of very cartoons, but it sold consistently. For, and the first programme went out on the 1st of January 1990. But it's quite interesting, because it wasn't the easiest thing to sell. BBC Two said they might do it 10-minute slots late at night. Um, well, it was only uh, Channel 4, I'm still waiting for the meeting. Um, <laughs> and, but it was really fantastic, and this is what it comes down to, usually it's individuals. So a guy called John Howard Davis, who had been head of comedy at the BBC, he looked after the Pythons and all the you know, golden age of stuff in those days. He got the Thames. And he persuaded the powers of be to give us half an hour of prime time. And we didn't charge any fees, which is hence how we came to own it. And, uh, and it just went through the roof. We only made 14, but I mean... It, it's, it's only it's, 14? Yeah, yeah. I mean, more in animation, obviously, in a couple of movies. But the, it, I've travelled a lot in the world. I mean, a lot, a lot, a lot. I mean, you know, um, because I used to be chairman of Comic Relief for a long time, so you go to the very you know, in obscure places. And one thing, calling card, wherever you were, was Mr. Bean. <laughs> that could be on the you know, Kenyan Somalian border, it could be in the, you know, somewhere in Asia. Every, I mean universal. It was extraordinary. And still is actually. Right? The highlight of the Olympics. How in the Olympics, yeah. With Simon Rattler, who's my best friend at, at um, Liverpool School, at my primary school. Yeah. Oh, yeah. So Mr. Bean is up there as a I guess it's, a, it's a, something you're very proud of. You also produced Vicar of Dibley, Catherine Tate Show, Lady Henry Show, um, Billy Elliot, the film that I think it took everyone's breath away when they, they saw it. Which productions are you most proud of, do you think, of your time? Well, on the whole, I like things that make maximum impact. Big pop, the most, more difficult to make big populist programming than it is to make niche programming. It's much easier... So if you do a big popular drama, there was a series we made, which is about three or four series for BBC One called Playing the Field, which is probably long forgotten, but it was Kay Mellor, who's a brilliant, brilliant mainstream television writer, Sunday night, um, BBC One, and I thought, you know, that that's a sort of... And Robin Hood we did for Saturday nights, and I, so I like those sort of things. I mean, there are some programmes, I think the one with the... One of the highest impact, I did one with Paul Greengrass with on the Omar bombings. And that was, you know, about well, over 20 years ago now, but it was quite hairy because 
you know, we named the bombers at the end of this reconstruction of the Omar bombings, the real 4 l real IRA bombers. And these were not good guys, as you can imagine. And they hadn't been ever, we suspect the government did a deal with them, but it's never quite been established as part of the peace negotiations. But they then got private prosecutions and two of them did go to jail. Um, and they were mass murderers, you know, with no, you know, they shouldn't have been given any uh, immunity. So uh, that was, uh, and it was, you know, Paul Greengrass, a uh, total genius program maker. He wrote it, actually, somebody else directed it. But uh, so I think that that would probably, but again, the big poppy ones. And I love my Mr. Bean, so, you know. Uh, <laughs> with, with changing sensibilities over time, do you think now there are some programs you made that wouldn't get commissioned now? Ooh. Yeah, I'm sure. I mean, on the whole, they were mostly above par. There was a very dodgy series called Something for the Weekend with Denise Van Outen. <laughs> <laughs> I remember Will Wyatt, good Oxford man, because it, it, wasn't, it was for Channel 4, not for BBC, and he just said, you shouldn't have your name anywhere near that programme. <laughs> it was a bit raunchy um, and vulgar. Yeah, so, uh, and there was an absolutely ghastly hit show, and I remember one of called Beat the Crusher, with Freddie Starr for Star, first guy. And Elizabeth Murder went to the sky and we somehow conned her to commission this thing. And Freddie Starr was not a producible performer. Were, but, the, were the alarm bells not ringing when you heard it was Freddie Starr? Well, yeah, but it was the way it got, that's who they wanted. And then people, it was, a, it was a, some sort of quiz competition thing. Then if you lost, your car got crushed. <laughs> Literally. Your actual car. You. Yeah, yeah, I got, yeah, beat the crusher. Yeah, yeah, in, in the car park, I didn't know. Yes, it, but it's not, it wasn't, it's not one I would, um, I should have cared, I shouldn't remind myself, even though it was awful. <laughs> 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 I was the producer of the and then became the CD executive. How did you Who are you his name? Who, who? Who produced the record? Clive Tallow was the main executive producer. Who became head of Oh, Mark Lindsay. Mark Lindsay. Yeah, yeah, that's right. <laughs> Oh, Crusher, she was on Crusher, yeah, yeah. That's the worst of a program. He says that as well, doesn't he? Okay, well. Everyone's, everyone's worst ever program. Yeah. Um, so you, you stood down as um, chairman of Tiger Aspects in 2011. Was that a difficult decision? Because it's obviously a company you'd founded, or did you feel it was just time no, to No, not really. I, I, think, I think with any... Well, it depends what line of work you're in. But I think, yeah, television is, a, is by and large a young people's game, or it has become such. And I found something rather difficult about selling stuff to people 15, 20 years younger, because, you know, life moves on. And funny enough, you know, my kids are all about, I was about 35, 40 when I had them. So you're quite close to that generation, but the gap in between. I, and I just found it sort of increasingly difficult, because you, you're convinced you can make better programming than most people. Uh, and, you know, do it above par. But then you've got them with a slightly different shift. So I don't, I don't regret it all. And now, I, find, you know, I don't know what the average age of BBC employees is or Channel 4, but it'll be pretty low. Uh, so in a way, move on. I was quite happy to move on. You're clearly a brilliant talent spotter. You've heard about all the stuff, uh, the programmes that you've done. And you set up the talent agency about the year before you, right about the same time, but maybe the year before you set up Tiger Aspects, um, and you have such a fantastic list of people. So many of my, my personal favourite comedians are on your book. So Eddie Izzard, um, you've got Rod Atkinson, Lenny Henry, and um, the fabulous Barry Humphreys was one of yours. You know, so much miss, and you know what a star across so many generations. From me when I was little, probably from my parents when they were kind of middle aged. So. Let's talk a bit about Barry. What what was he like? Because we, we we know him as his characters on 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 stage. We know him as Dame Edna. I'm sure there are lots of Dame Edna fans in. Um, what was he like in real life? Was he as I was just talking to Mary about him? I used to would have worked with him at, uh, when she was at the Winters. Um, well, he was a very extraordinarily brilliant man. You know, he was just. Uh, and I encourage you to go and read it. He wrote two memoirs. They're both absolutely. Usually written accounts of his life. One of his basically his upbringing in Melbourne, and the first one was more 
through the 60s and 70s and all the stuff he did with Spike Milligan and Peter Cook. And, but they're all brilliant men. They're, 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 I mean, those three, I mean, just titanically brilliant people uh, who were originals as well. So what I think Barry's particular quality is, you know, his, his brain's a bit like a ventriloquist. I work with an adult called Nina Conti. She can think of three different things at the same time. So if you're Dame Edna, you're having to think as Barry, but you're doing it as Dame Edna and you're interacting with the audience. And, and he, he just had it down to, mastery, his use of language, very stylish man. So it was a great loss. I mean, he was 89 and getting on, and, uh, you know, he probably went a bit earlier than, he, than anybody would have wished. But he was um, working right up to the end, and a highly, highly educated individual. I mean, self... Well, I mean, he went to Melbourne Grammar School, did this and that, and the other became a Dadaist. And, but he was so well-read. And a brilliant collector, a brilliant painter. Yeah, so he's just a one-off genius. How long had he been with your agency? Uh, uh, 25 years, yeah. I mean, he'd fallen out with all his agents. <laughs> Big time. Repeatedly. Uh, over money. <clears throat> he had a great need, desire for money. He had lots of divorces and pictures to buy. And and, uh, and so I said, well, look, Barry, we're not going to research you and I'm not going to fall out over money. So if you want me to do a deal for you, I'll do it. But if you want to do it yourself, go and mess it up. <laughs> so he used to do that. You know, he'd think, oh, I can cut somebody out here or get some crooked Aussie in, you know. And um, <laughs> But then he'd always realise the error of his way. Then he'd send, and I, I what I treasure, some of the most treasure, he'd then send you a present because he realised he'd behaved either badly or stupidly. But the presents were, you know, like one was a proof copy of Pacoon, which Spike had given to him, and he gave Arnold and beautiful books or artistic prints. I mean, amazing, amazing man, a light enhancing person, and a genius, and difficult as hell. <laughs> They're all tricky, all these, all, it's almost a universal rule that very creative people are extremely complicated. I was going to ask, how do you? Handle talent. Well, you sort of got to respect the the talent and not mind the complication in a way. So you've got to like them. So I've turned down quite a lot of people over the years because I just didn't particularly take to them. Who who you turned down? Well, you can whisper. <laughs> just whisper. You're among friends. I mean, you're among friends. But, but some who were just too high maintenance, and I put Sasha Baron Cohen. He just wanted too much of my time that I didn't have. But I think he's totally outstanding, and I would have loved to work with Sasha Baron Cohen. I'm perfectly happy not to work with Ricky Gervais, even though he's extremely good. And I've uh, dispensed with a couple of people over the years. You know, it's a fellow on QI. Yeah. But, um, but by and large, you know, these are long-term relationships. Amanda Yannucci, Chris Morris, we've worked with these guys for over 30 years. Lenny, Ray, all, Eddie, all these people, or Susie is now, she, he now is. These are long-term relationships. Uh, the league, all the League of Gentlemen boys who are brilliant, Reeves and Mortimer, brilliant. And they do their own thing. Like Jim's become a, they can become an artist. Does his painting Rick gets a TV it? show out of it. Bob gets a TV show out of it. I think <laughs> fishing is bored me to death, but it's very popular. I mean, it's crazy. So when you look back at Vic and Bob and how anarchic they were, oh, that, that, that now Vic's painting and Bob's fishing. Yeah, I know. I know. <laughs> They're wonderful people. Really wonderful, wonderful, and totally, again, original talents. And they sort of, well, they could have been the, you know, the next Eric and Ernie, and they got there close, and then they went off, and the, you know, but it was so fickle broadcasting. You get a new channel controller in, and they'll they want to bring the changes. You know, I think it it, it sort of. I mean, they've all had great careers, so I'm not knocking them, but it's never it's never as easy as it appears to either maintain a long career. I mean, Lenny Henry is a good example. And then he'd done a show for the BBC year in, year out for 30 years or something since he was a kid almost. And then suddenly he got a new controller of BBC One who clearly didn't like him, this lady, who went on to run Channel 4, I think, and, um, and Channel 5. And he, and he just I couldn't get him arrested. I mean, apart from doing Comic Relief every year, that was it. So we, we started doing theatre. Now he's come back, he could do more television, does do more television now, but he's also got into the theatre thing in a big way. He just finished an incredible show at the Bush Theatre. You know, five-star reviews from the Telegraph to the Guardian. You know, it's quite rare to get the range. 
about, which he wrote about the Windrush uh, character. And he's done Shakespeare, he's done the National Theatre, you know, so what? I mean, these are fantastic people to work with. How does the relationship work? So if you took Lenny Henry, for example, how much work would <laughs> Lenny be offered directly or through people that he knew and how much would you find from uh, him? And how, how do you steer, steer a, a, a talent? Because well, you've got a range, you've got comedians, you've got actors, yeah, you've got writers. Yeah. How do you steer their decision making? Well, it's much them? easier if they're getting offered work and then you choose between what to do. It's more difficult initiating stuff or trying to break people. Uh, but it's, if they've got the talent, it'll it'll probably happen. But Lenny, it's just, you know he's a very uh, he danger with him. He, he's too driven, so he wants to do everything the whole time. He wants a new production company, and you, and you just say to try and do fewer things in greater depth. And he wants to then you know be a writer and then an actor. So, you know, so it's just a matter of, of choosing between different priorities. But it's not it's never boring. Someone, someone I suppose you signed more recently is, I saw you have Bridget Christie yeah. on it, and she's about to have, she's been around on the comedy circuit for a while, done quite a lot of radio for, I really, I really like her. Yes, you're um, right. She's married to Stuart Lee, who I also really like very much. Right. Um, the, but she's got a TV sitcom about the menopause, yes. uh, which is about to start on Channel 4. Yeah. So would, would the agency play a part in making that happen, or would that be something? Yeah, and a colleague who does, oh my God, I've got a colleague who does most of the work. Um, not unless you've gone off to the Arctic for the week, although <laughs> conveniently. Um, yeah, yeah, so we'd be an instrumental part in, in yeah, putting pressure on to get, because broadcasters always have a choice. You know, for every one sitcom they choose, there'll be five that they've said no to. So you've just got to get yourself ahead of the queue. And on the whole, they're risk averse. They say they're not, but they are. So they don't want anything that's... You know, same like films. I mean, in Hollywood's even worse, you know, in its ultimate example. They just... You sell a film by saying it's like this plus that equals this, rather than this is an original funny idea. And that to agree, even with The Vicar of Dibley, I mean, it was not an easy sell. All of it in retrospect. Because if I was a commissioner, I'd say... I want Rich, what Richard Curtis does next. He'd already done Blackadder and not the nine o'clock news. So you'd say, well, I want that guy. But they don't think like that. It's fun. It's, it's very odd. But, um, but you know, again, these things got to happen. But the lot that didn't get to happen, and, you, you know, you, that eats away at you, saying, oh, if only, you know. How, can you, how much eff- time and effort could you invest in a, in a project that didn't happen? Quite a lot, yeah. Because yeah. yeah. films and TV series can take a yeah, long yeah. time. Yeah, but you, you're going to, you're not going to get the majority of your stuff over the line, but then you can see what's getting a bit of traction. I mean, it's, and again, it's to do with writing. Writing is just the key. You've got the writers, then you'll get the actors. And if you've got the actors, then you'll get the, the commission. So, and there are, uh, you know, number, you know, Stephen Moffat, Mark Gator, these are, but they're the people you need to be working with. Really. Uh, and they're the people in broadcast that should be desperate to, you know, Russell T. Davis, brilliant genius. You'll see the pattern of work. Kate Mello had that touch. She was just totally brilliant. And the popular touch of, of, of writing. But these are obsessive people as well. They're, it doesn't happen easily. They're very driven people, brilliant writers. So you're identifying brilliant writers, brilliant stars. What makes a brilliant agent? Ah, well, having brilliant writers, brilliant stars. <laughs> So it's it's. Uh, what what skills? Yeah, what skills that, the yeah, it's just you know. So it's not just good about taste. And, no, it's good taste and low ego. So uh, and being well connected. And funny, I feel less. I'm you know, increasingly less connected with a generation down. That's why you hire people who are connected. You know, so. Uh, Is patience important? Yeah, 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 <laughs> yeah, 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 very. <laughs> Yeah, they're very difficult, these people. <laughs> and they can just, you know, Harry Enfield, I worked with for 23 years. And he was godfather of my son. I love him. I'm still friends with him. But he wrote a one line email one day, just coming up to half term, saying, I've decided to change age. One line email. 23 years. Yeah. Films, TV series, stage shows, adverts. Uh, you know, you're one of the most successful people in the country. But somebody didn't answer his phone or something sparked, you know. And did he go? He did. 
Yeah, yeah. And I asked him, I didn't, you know, I've always been upset by it. And I was having a meal with him last year. And I said, do you, did you ever think about that again or regret that decision? He said, of course not. <laughs> <laughs> he said, I want to do something else in my life. I said, you've done exactly the same, but just not quite as well. <laughs> and what would, you, what would you have done on a more serious note around the Philip Schofield situation that happened? Because obviously he was then dropped by his... Yeah, I wouldn't have dropped him, actually. I would have let him, I would help ride the crisis with whatever, how much much he'd lied to you or... I think you have to help people when they're in a corner, you know, and and I think that applies in life, you know, again, through the... You know, I've had a very gilded life, but, you know, through the charity work you're doing, mental health agendas now, you see people who would be very... get themselves into terrible corners... So I think that was the wrong thing for them to do, personally, unless there's something I don't know. Um, I think that's what we all keep thinking, is there something we yeah, don't know, because know. it seems... Uh, you know, I was watching a bit of it on the telly last night, uh, yesterday at the office. Why are they having a parliamentary committee looking into this issue? Absolutely ridiculous. And then the, um, Karen called Adam for breakfast, actually, and he just said, I want her as a MP, not them. <laughs> Um, but, uh, you know, it, it, these things happen. I mean, obviously, the really, really, really bad one, uh, which was, was never handled and people were never held to account for it properly, was Savile, because that was known and it was covered up. And nobody, and all the people, you know, in a very BBC way, slithered out of their responsibilities and just retrospectively Tony Hall lost, got, got it in the neck. But I, I think in general, and they are, I mean, when I say these people are complicated, he was obviously beyond complicated, but he got away with it because of his celebrity. So it's a very interesting area. I, I had a pang when I, mean, I read that Rolf Harris died in prison the other day. And if you'd worked with Rolf, you know, he, did, he was just a larger than life. Now, I don't really ever know quite how bad his thing, but... He had a very rough time in prison. He had to be moved out of Oxfordshire prisons and sent up to North Wales because he was getting such a bad time. And that's a, you know, that's a, these are human beings who've gone wrong. You know, so I, I feel quite sort of protective in a way of people who've got into trouble. I was going to say, do you feel protective of your clients? Because oh, you do, yeah. especially in lots of the papers now, especially like the Daily Mail, Sidebar of Shame, Everyone's a target, aren't they, on the, for the way they look or anything small they've said, and there's lots of clickbait there. And I think it's easy to forget that they there are people inside that bikini or behind that car or coming out of a nightclub. Yeah, yeah. But I suppose, you know, if you're using fame or, you know, power, this Philip Schofield thing to do genuinely bad things. Now, obviously, you should be held to account for that, and it is totally reprehensible, certainly if it involves, well, you know, the Jimmy Savile stuff. I mean, I don't have, that, you know, very minimal sympathy, still a person, but, uh, yeah, but everybody, you know, there by the grace of God. You know. Like that brilliant <clears throat> programme in the back prison, what's it called, Time? Everybody watched Time, that three-part of Anne and Bleasdale. That's got a second series. Oh, back, God, bloody it? hell, you see this guy who's leading a life, gets pissed, gets hits a cyclist, and you're in Walton Nick, you know, oh, my goodness me. Powerful. We talk about using your powers for bad. You used your powers for good. Um, comic relief. Let's talk about comic relief and sport relief. <laughs> mm-hmm. you, you helped set up comic relief. You, As you mentioned, you were, you were chairman for... 15 years, was it? And mm-hmm. um, we take comic relief for granted now. I think it's so, so much part of everyone's mindset and life in the UK. How difficult was it to get that project off the ground? Again, it's a Richard Curtis project, isn't it? Lenny yeah, well, it is. Yeah, I mean, Richard is the initiator of the whole thing. You know, well, you know it's just a sort of enabler, again, a wingman for him in a way. But, you know, if you have somebody that driven, again, I mean, we, funny enough, thinking about it now, they've got this Blackadder programme on tonight about the pilot for Black Adder, and I remember that being written on, on holiday with Richard and Rowan, and so it's probably early 80s, probably 81, probably, or something like that. And they were already quite successful because they'd done not the nine top news. And, but you had that sort of, well, they had, you know, just useful sort of optimism and enthusiasm. So in, in the end, it turned out to be, with a very compliant BBC, not that difficult, actually. 
because and then it was it brought the best out of the BBC and to a degree still does because I think the BBC is shot full of structural problems and I think it's a completely schizophrenic organisation between news and entertainment and they all try and bash it all together and it all goes clunk and you know and it's too big a job for one person as well I think but um, but when you get the machine working in the way you did with comedy where you've got the nations of the regions the radio the online the studios you can get any star to do anything everybody does everything for nothing it's a lot of fun for the Participants, you know, Sport Relief Mile was the biggest uh, participatory event in the in the country that we, you know, built just built up over the years, and you get the Winnikers <laughs> and David Beckham's at the time, or whatever, to support. So it was an absolutely joyous thing to be part of. You know, okay. really great. Charity stayed a big part of your life. Did that experience with Comic Relief really cement how important? working for charities was for you? Well, I mean, I've just been very lucky. So, well, you know, it's just, it's sort of an extension of what I do or I did. Because, you know, if you know the top brass and the broadcasters, then you can just say, I mean, you do have problems. All these things have issues. You know, because you know, I mean, we had these big deals with Sainsbury's and, you know, these big commercial beasts. And uh, when you have them, the noses turn out to be, they're all made of China. And, you know, they, they were toxic or there was something. You know, and who pays for them? You know, there are big fights to be had, but you've got like-minded people. You've brought the best out of organisations and people, and you know, and we used to get a cheque for ten million quid every year from Sainsbury's because their staff engagement, their product sales, and we because we only you could only buy a load if you went into got it at Sainsbury's or an Oxfam shop in Sainsbury's, the real thing, and that drove an extra million people into Sainsbury's stores during the four or five week campaign. You know, which was commercially very valuable to them because, you know, Tesco's was twice the size. And, uh, yeah, I remember when they, I found out that the management of Comedy without really referring it had very close to doing a deal with Tesco's. It was in 2005. And then I found out, I said, you can't do that. We need to go have a proper process. And there was a new guy taking over at the same thing called Justin King. So I trotted along to see him, took some advice, and he said, well, I can do this. I don't want to lose this. I've inherited a crock of shit here. Sorry, language. I'm not sure. um, <laughs> it's all right. Paul Makey Archer has paved the way for yeah, language yeah, a few right, years yeah. ago. Well, you have packs there, you know, to a wretch. <laughs> um, and, and anyway, he uh, said, tell me what you want, and I'll tell you if I can do it. And I go and see a Tesco guy, and he said, I want to see you at 8, eight o'clock in the morning. And they, they're eating some part of deepest Essex. I had to get up at four o'clock. Oh, yes. God. Oh, my God. Um, anyway, they, they were so arrogant and wouldn't help the sporting side. So in the end, even though they were twice the size, I rang this bloke up. I remember I was on Paddington Station getting back on a Friday evening and uh, I said, I'm afraid we're sticking with what we've got. And he went absolutely nuts. He said, right, <laughs> uh, you'll be here with my lawyers over the weekend. You'll be in court. I'm going to the Charity Commission. What do you want? And I said, it's done. You've not, you know, you said you'd like, tell me how much you like delisting products for people who cross your path at Tesco. I've just delisted you. <laughs> that was bad tactics. And uh, anyway, he went nuts. And I, in the end, bought him off with two VIP tickets to the Make Public History concert in Hyde Park. <laughs> <laughs> Well, when uh, when you stood down from Comrade Relief, you were succeeded by Tim Davey. So I'll be coming to him in a minute. Yeah. <laughs> I have some stuff to ask about him. Um, uh, charity, after Comet Relief, you went to Save the Children, and now you work with a mental health charity. Why, why is charity so important to you? It seems like such a big part of your well, life now. I mean, let me, uh, you know, I went to Winchester and Cambridge. I've got lots of money. <laughs> I've got lots of contacts. And there are lots of phenomenally brilliant people working in these sectors. You know, not doing it for money and not doing it for fame. They're doing it because they care about humanity. Or you've got someone like Richard who just wants to change the world. So he does it on a big scale. But most charities, you know, obviously have particular aim and, the, you know, not necessarily modest ambitions. They're big ambitions. So if you can bring, you know, what you know about to help them do what they do, then that's just a sort of natural thing to do in my you. I don't, don't see why one wouldn't, you know, you can find the time. and uh, So 
and, and I don't feel particularly virtuous about it. It's just, you know, I've been a very lucky guy, you know. And, uh, and it's fun. It's interesting. It's always fun. It's always interesting. Now, this mental health young people agenda at the moment, it's, it's puzzling. This sort of levels of anxiety, depression, sort of, you know, I mean, suicide rates aren't necessarily going up, but it's more of a, more of a, it's, it's, it's more of a public issue. The effect of these, um, the online effect is very interesting, you know, I'm doing some academic work and, you know, funding academic work into getting more data, you know, evidence of why what is happening and all this, you know, cancelled culture. You know, and I came unstuck at Save the Children. I mean, I, I said something that somebody didn't like in a meeting and I still don't know what it is that I said. But uh, it led to me losing my position of just having to resign for a perceived a perceived disconnect with the cultural changes required. You know, so what's that? So that was very bruising, actually, and, uh, you know, I won't have anything to do with them because I felt betrayed, actually. And, you know, because I was qualified to do that job and I was trying to reform the thing, same like Oxfam needs reforming. You know, they're too big, these places. And they've got, I don't know if you saw them, I recommend you go and read this 93-page book that Oxfam put out. It's available online. But it's, it's embarrassing that so much time and money has been spent saying you can't use the word mankind, you know, or you can't use the word mother and father. I mean, it's ridiculous. It's not what they're there to do. They're not our thought police. They're there for Oxfam, you know, wonderful organisation, wonderful heritage, just down the road from here, as you know. And it's the same to save the children. They've lost the plot. And they still have lost the plot, in my view. We've got amazing things about them. You know, and, and the best thing I'd say with her was Princess Anne. She was bloody absolutely formidable, incredible woman. And would do, you know, travel the world and, you know, and broker things and convene things. You know, so you know, I think they, they're not, they're just, they're just an evil for me. Tell us a bit more about Princess Anne. Yeah, well, no, no, <laughs> because, no. All I say is because, that, because she's 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 yeah. always represented as the, as the hardest working royal. Oh, she was unbelievable. I mean, I went to a trip to Senegal with her. And that, Senegal, no, um, Sierra Leone, Sierra Leone. And you know, you know, I did a couple of things in a day, and I was looking after a major donor who was spending money in the country. It was a perfectly pleasant thing to go and see interesting things. You look at her schedule. Yeah, she'd be up from six, then she's in the hospital, then she's in a this and then that. And then you have a big state. She has a state banquet in the evening and. Absolutely incredible. So just right through, solid, always briefed, always new, always had time for people. I mean, it really... Good sense of humour. Yeah, 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 very uh, contrary. Whatever you said, she'd tend to take the opposite. Would you have taken her on today? Well, <laughs> as an well you're always polite. But I mean, <laughs> yeah, too. Yeah, I remember saying, you know, we're, we're focusing on early years, <laughs> say the children, for early years interventions for you know, education and brain development. Why? Rubbish. Yeah, it started at six. Well, anyway, she just she liked being provocative, but that's great. And and she was, you know, I have the deepest admiration for her. It seems like everything you do, you do with so much integrity. Your TV career was recognised with um, awards from BAFTA and the RTS. Um, the time that you were making television seems like a slightly different time. We're now in this um, Tim Davy would have it as our digital time when we're trying to make television whilst also thinking about streaming services and putting content online. Do you think that the push towards digital is a hindrance to creativity and storytelling or a help? Travis, so it is much more diverse. I mean, there are pluses and minuses, obviously, and, and how he's going about his digital revolution, which he tried to do a comic relief, which, you know, I wouldn't have done it that way, but you have to let people do what they do. But um, obviously the way you can now... Consume, as they say, television in often different shapes and forms, and this incredible eye player. They've done a lot of things very well, but and that's why I say it's such a schizophrenic organisation. That's great for entertainment. I think for news, it's a whole different ball game, and you're a victim of that at the moment. The way they're sort of stripping out local services. Now, I think one of the main BBC services is where there's effectively market failure or market paucity without the BBC. So that uh, applies to children's television. BBC children, beautifully run part of the BBC, but they're always taking money away from them or sending them up to Manchester when the real estate's down. You know, they're treated like 
they're not the centre of excellence and importance that they are. And I think local news is, you know, you're not going to get it from the commercial thing in the same way. And so that's where I think the politics should be. And you can't hide behind a digital revolution. <laughs> and in the World Service, when my brother worked as a sort of frontline reporter for many decades, really, they've just sort of destroyed the editorial validity of a lot of what it was there, in my view. And, you know, in a lot of these places, televisions aren't that common, but radios are, but they've dismissed radio effectively. Uh, so... Uh, I mean, I'm not saying these aren't there aren't choices because they're finite resources. But if you can't run, you know, what's it, three, four billion pound state broadcaster, being able to do these sort of things, you're doing something wrong. And don't pay Gary and one and a half million pounds. He's brilliant, but you don't need him. You know, you don't need to spend a hundred million pounds on Eurovision in the end. You know, if that's what they really did spend, which you seemed to what he was saying in the committee the other day. But uh, but having said that, it is very easy to throw, you know, lob in bombs from the side. But I, I, again, I think it needs just some fundamental rethink how it's governed and structured. And they probably need, uh, I would I'd argue that it should be divided in two. You have BBC as a news and current affairs with all the rules. Because the very things in comedy that I work in you know, you, you basically want to be offending people some of the time, or you certainly don't want to be bad. <laughs> but you have to, you now get judged. You know, scripts literally get judged about saying, well, you can't say that because it's not, it's not balanced. It's not, um, what's it, impartial. But risk, risk-taking always seems to have been yeah, such a big part of, of the comedy programmes. Yeah, so you just neuter, neuter it, and, that, and that's not how you're going to get provocative you know, I mean, the same. I mean, I don't think they could even repeat uh, 40 Towers now, I doubt. Not so you wouldn't be able to. Because of the, you know, maybe, you know, there's some argument for that, but you certainly wouldn't get any commission that's that funny. <laughs> <laughs> you know, so I, it's, it's a huge uh, issue. And I, and I think it's, again, it's too, the Director General probably has too much. <laughs> power, I think, probably. And they've messed up all the governance with the chairman, you know. You shouldn't have private equity people running these things. I mean, they need people who are good at money in the mix. I'm not sure he's come across as a perfectly decent guy, sharp, but, you know, you just, it's just the wrong set of, the wrong background to run the most important cultural institution in the country. And again, the music side is so vital the BBC to the health of our musical infrastructure don't undo it it's also about storytelling isn't it because whether mm. when, when we work in local news every even a 20 second thing that we would write is still a 20 second story where you have to connect with someone and tell it in the clearest way you can and from a very small 20 second story to the big kind of two and a half hour films that might get made it's it is the power of storytelling and creativity and and the the process surrounding that that can get really lost in all the arguments about yeah, that how much expertise, isn't it? Talent and expertise, and and people having done it and been trained properly. Again, the training function for the BBC is absolutely vital. But if you then dispense with people who've been trained and been doing it for a long time, then it's going to suffer. And there's short-term savings for long-term losses, really. So, um, uh, yeah, um, not a job I'd want. <laughs> You've had such an interesting career, and I think really nurturing talent in so many different ways, not just the stars, but also the people who will be behind the scenes and with your work in charity. So you've had your you've had your TV and film, you've had your agency and all your charity work. If you could pick just one strand of that, if you'd only have one, which one would you well, start? Well, it all mixes up in a way. I mean, you know, I always, I can see I just think of representing people actually because you know you always, again you think about the ones that get away and there are a couple of always amuse me that uh, you have this really bumptious runner in the sort of 2000, 2001, 2002 I suppose you'd always say come and see my show and I said get me a cup of tea uh, <laughs> it's not off Michael anyway that was Michael McIntyre <laughs> <laughs> who is brilliant I think you know and again I love mainstream talent like that who can hold a Palladium stage and deliver in the way that he does 
Um, was, as an agent, would if, so you turn, you, you turn down Michael McIntyre when he's a young chap, and yeah. then he's with a different agency. Would you ever try to poach? No, no, no. I mean, I'd always say somebody if you ever fall, fall out with somebody, you know, one's always there. But it's a very, it's quite a, I mean, not everybody. Interestingly enough, the agency who looked after Philip Schofield, who didn't back him, they, they seduced Claudia Winkleman from us about four years ago because they do a lot of entertainment. So it's probably, pitch, but that was an active bit of poaching, which we wouldn't do. Um, but, uh, yeah, yeah, but, you know, talent attracts talent. You always want more. There were a couple more that got away, haven't they? I remember a TV thing. There was this, you know, this sort of family story, really. When we first moved to Oxford back in uh, 1997, it was. I had three little kids, and we were sort of, my wife was still a barrister, and it was quite, you know, sort of full on. And you know, we got, uh, we had a nanny who then got pregnant. So I had to get a maternity nanny just to see us through this period. And uh, John Lloyd, the Blackadder producer, and, and all the other things he'd done. There, there's a lady he knew, and then her mum we knew from Fulham, where we lived before, made Kurt. Anyway, so we got this lady in. And the kids, after some man, three weeks, said, this, this ain't working. And they're small, you know, they're single figures. And, um, you know, four or five, and they said she's always on the phone, she <laughs> crashes the car, she doesn't tell you, she's absolutely. <laughs> Not like our lovely tour tour, you know. <laughs> and um, anyway, in the end, my daughter was quite forceful and she basically rebelled. And um, so I paid her off. That's that's super nanny. <laughs> <laughs> no. <laughs> Joe Frost, Joe super Frost. nanny. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, um, has anyone got any questions for Peter? Yes. Um, so thank you for, for that fascinating um, conversation. Um, the only side of problem remembering one's passwords and login details, do you welcome the rise of multi uh, channel television? It, it, it is a good thing. Uh, and secondly, I also asked, I also asked, what's, your, what's, what's the best thing you've watched on television? Right, well, I mean, I think it's great there are more outlets. The danger is that things are made with less time and less money because of the dilution. And you've got to have within the mix, and that's again the BBC come in, but they, they have a very small amount of money compared to the Netflixes, but if you're making something Netflix, it's got to be globally attractive. So you're not going to get lovely, beautiful British documentaries or a film about Angmar made by Netflix. Um, so it's more limiting in that way, but it obviously expands the market. And, and so it's very good. If you're in mainstream drama writing and production at the moment, it's an amazing place to be because this money is pouring into it, but into a particular type of product. And it's, you know, but again, they're not doing it. Comedy doesn't travel on the whole. I mean, this means an exception on the rule on that. And, and, um, and there was my sort of professional mentor was a wonderful lady called Beryl Virtue, who died last year whose daughters have taken over a business and brilliant, they make Sherlock and, you know, but, but Beryl, I mean, she told me these stories when she was out trying to do a deal with Tina Turner with, with Ike, you know, they're drunk with gums. I mean, she had a hell of her. She looked up to Spike and, yeah, but and she came from the secretary to being a major sort of player in, 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 in TV and, and she just always just went after time and excellence, took her time. And, and so that's, that's what's vulnerable. But it's great, you know, you, YouTube and think people can experiment and can make an impact. I mean, there's a lot of rubbish out there as well. You know, so being able to get yourself noticed. But it, it give people calling cards. So it's liberating in a way. But you need training and you need time and you need money. I might be alone in a multi-channel world, but when I... I, try, I, I stop and then I, I start and then stop so many dramas that are put on streaming services because I just don't feel that I connect with them and then every now and then something really good comes up that really captures my everything so there's a, a series that the BBC are now doing but they haven't put it all onto the iPlayer in one go they're doing it episode right. episode called Best Interest right. which is Jack Thorne who you mentioned who oh, did the most in the queue and yeah. it's absolutely fun, it's absolutely fantastic it's Sharon Horgan Michael Sheen right, um, and it's just so well written and I think yeah. even in that sea of channels and if you look onto the apps and the streaming services, you, you still only get a very few outstanding 
kind of series. Yeah, but again, you need the Jack Thorns. It's a bit like, you know, Tom Stoppard or, you know, I mean, mainly plays, but of course, you know, I, I, we watched Shakespeare in Love the other day, and of course, I've forgotten Stoppard and done the screenplay, you know, and it shows. Um, and uh, so you do get these exceptional people who rise and become, you know, and then they have to, you know, they're, they're currently, I mean, they're, I'm sure a lot of people, you need Sky to have seen it, will have seen Succession, which is, you know, and again, I work with Amanda and Nucci who did Deep for HBO, and mostly all the Succession team are people he basically trained up over the years. They're all part of his sort of, and he had a unit that, you know, with the BBC funded initially to train these people up. And they land up directing it, which incredible. You know, all these people, and they all—they all, all of them seem to have executive producing credits, which is just like getting easy money or something. See, but um, but it is excellent. I'm I'm always intrigued with the conversations that must take place because obviously, if you take the BBC and uh, Sky, or if you watch on Now TV, some series are just dumped in entirety as a box set on day one, yeah. and others like Line of Duty, like Best Interest, yeah, yeah, like there's a decision the made that they will only be put on. Drip fed once we like succession, and it's it's sort of it's like somebody higher up has gone and missed up everything that we've got. This amazing streaming, hundreds and hundreds of programs. No, this is actually this is this is a bit classier. So we're going to keep people hanging and yeah. getting them to come and watch. Yeah, I mean, I, I sort of fell out of love with the crown as it got closer to modern day. I think originally it was when it was sort of more historic, it was more appealing, and then because you know that they're making it up and. So when it gets more recent, so but but again, but I love these homemade British, you know, be a line of duty, you know, some fantastic British cop thing, or that's why I love playing the field, you know, certainly Yorkshire, it was earthy, it was gritty, and, and all the other stuff that cared in fat friends with K or what my company did. So when I say I, I mean my company, I usually just do get the money to make it happen and then hire the best people, and then you just let it happen, and you're there to deal with it if something when and if something goes wrong. You know, and that can be anything. It can be an accident or it can be weather or, you know, whatever. Well, I'll tell you, I'll tell one more funny story about something going wrong. Tell us about your role in the appointment of Grant Thompson. Did you tackle them? How are you persuading me? Secondly, what is your biggest owner? Does, does that sound like Grant Thompson's sweet? Well, yeah, he's not the biggest owner. The, the top end people are very, very comfortable. Lives. I mean, some work hard. You know, Rowan is a very, very wealthy guy because he sells television programs in two hundred countries. Yeah, yeah, no, he works. He, he's more, you know. Alexander, Alexander Armstrong probably appears in more categories on your yeah, yeah, talent yeah. website. Yeah, yeah. He's, because very, he's very, actor, he's very writer, hard working, indeed. Comedian. Yeah, I mean, if you're plugged into America, the economics is completely different from America. So if you're making programs for HBO, like Armando Lucci or like with Je- I don't know after Jesse Armstrong. They are plugged into a different level of reward because it's a different economy. But in Britain, you know, you can see the hardworking people you see a lot will be paying good money on the whole. And uh, but I just tell you know, I just tell a funny story at the moment again. When you think about what you do when things go wrong, we're making these Robin Hood series, which are great, and we filmed them in Hungary. Again, mad. Why do you have to go to Hungary? Because they give you the tax breaks. You know, it seems to be nuts to me, but you could get more. Many, many, merry men for your lottie than you can do for your pound over here. Uh, anyway, we're coming to the law in the first series. And massive, we've built a castle and a village and, you know, a very good filming woods to film in and everything. Lots of horses and, you know, what's his name? Alan, uh, Billy Allen's dad, who was quite a wild guy, Keith Allen. We very well behaved on that, actually, but it was sort of lots to deal with and quite far removed. And then I get a call and I'm actually up in my, I've got a, I'm when I'm under, up in Anglesey and I'm playing golf with my brother, the world service guy, uh, rather badly. And I get this phone call and they say, we've had all our master tapes nicked and they're being, they're asking for a ransom. And my brother said, do you want the foreign, the Hungarian foreign secretary's private number? <laughs> <laughs> Actually, he gave it to me then. You know, I said, well, I won't ring him until I know. He said he won't want this to happen. So, but, uh, you know. So, anyway, we go into this thing. BBC runs the trip. Yeah, yeah. It's all getting announced. Getting, this is in August, and we're launching in September. And they've taken all the time in the lot. 
And, uh, and we had some different generation things, but you couldn't have broadcast it. So um, I get one of these firms who help you when you know with terrorists and <laughs> sort of crime. Uh, called Risk Something or Other, a Risk Solution, what you call And anyway, we worked with them, and they, it was clear that these guys were very good at nicking the stuff. It was an inside job, but they were not that expert at negotiating. And they didn't realize the value of what they had, which was basically they, had, they were worth 10 million. That would bring the replacement. And they were asking for 100,000. And But I kept worrying. And they'd only talk for a minute on the phone, and then they stopped because they thought they'd, they'd be tracked. It went on for about six weeks, this thing, and, and then eventually we, <laughs> we did a deal, and we offered a 50,000 reward, and they and anyway, they said, we'll do a deal. So we're giving them their 100 grand suitcases, which is John McCarry stuff in, in the <laughs> top car park, that's like Budapest, some hotel car park. So one night, half the tapes, half the money, I went, next night, they didn't show, get nervous again, anyway, then we re-engage. Re Show. I'm not here, I'm just monitoring all this. And suddenly, we were in, like, again, like, again, with a carry thing, lights come on, leash rave, they've been, they've been tapping all the phone calls, you know, the old habits die hard in East, in East Europe. <laughs> and they arrest these guys who then think we've done the dirty on them. You know, they join the sort of IRA blokes who you, you avoid in social occasions, you know, because they all went to prison and the police tried to claim the reward. <laughs> 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 Probably. <laughs> we got the tapes back. We lost three, but you could cover that. That was doable, and, uh, and nobody ever knew. And the BBC said, "Well, that was a bit." It feels bit... like you should be making a drama about yeah, no, the stealing well, of the. It was a very good. Uh, it was a very um, hairy. One of those things that's fine when it has a decent outcome. Do you think been... they were inspired by the Robin Hood yeah, yeah. robbing from the rich? That's how yeah, it yeah. Well, I think that's <laughs> literally how they thought. <laughs> Uh, yes, question. Um, thanks a lot. I thought that was great. And um, one of the things that struck me is that you, you seem to combine a kind of sustained geniality with dealing with what you call also some complications. <laughs> <laughs> I was just wondering how complicated these complications are. <laughs> just to take one example. I mean, I think I'm with you a lot of the way on what you say about cancel culture, about mm. and about old TV programmes which now wouldn't be shown, we should, obviously, and we had now. But I watched yesterday or the day before an old rerun of whatever happened to the lightning. Mm -hmm. I like that because mm -hmm. it struck me as a rare thing, you know, a funny, a funny programme about clubs, mm -hmm. and that was good. But I forgot, I think two thirds of the show I saw were race comics. Well, jokes about race, mm. and that isn't a kind of Lenny Bruce, let's challenge tough people. It was playing to prejudice. And I, I think Lenny Rossiter was a genius, but Ronnie down, I watched the game. Yeah, I mean, they are museum pieces now. I mean, you know, they reflected the culture at the yeah, time. They're not only reflected, they reinforced. Yeah, I and could argue that's that. That's a complication, because that's, you're not, they're not just hurting you as a game. Well, you've got it wrong. Yeah, but then you could ask, you could argue that you know the Don Warrington character in yeah. Rising Damp, you know, always had the better of, well, of the Rossiter character, you know. Um, <laughs> but I, I just think that there are these complications aren't Yeah, yeah, yeah. There are, there are obviously editorial considerations. I would absolutely agree with that. And you know, and you know, I had a pretty bruising experience working with John Cleese last year and, and you know, I wouldn't advocate. And, and, and didn't Lenny Henry start off his career being complicit with racism? No, he wouldn't think I that. Think he said. Well I mean, I'm not sure. No, well, because he was in the he was in the stage show of the black and white minstrels when he was seventeen. Yeah. You know, and he was seventeen. He was a lad from Dudley. No, and he beats him. yeah, but he beats himself up about it. I was like, don't beat yourself up about it. No, I'm not condemning. He was the only black guy in it. I'm not condemning. Yeah, yeah. So uh, and he does uh, but in a way he sort of shamed himself forty years later, yeah. whereas at the time I don't uh, I can't speak for him. Gary Lox and Hoxton first. Hmm? Gary Lox and Hoxton first. Right, yeah. Well, yeah, yeah, I mean yeah, it was undoubtedly, but I think some of his 
attitude towards it, which is something governed by his family as well, has evolved over the time. Whereas at the time, I think it was less of an issue. Yeah. And it becomes, in retrospect, something rather embarrassing to have done. But I don't think he should feel like that. He did it. He was a 17-year-old kid with a break. And he was earning money. Yeah, yeah. And he came from genuinely, really difficult. You know, first generation, yeah, Dudley, yeah. dad working in the steelworks. And his dad, as it transpired, since wasn't his dad, so it wasn't very nice to him. As nice as he might have been, you know. Dad was turned out, yeah, and he's gone public on that now, but only ten mm. few years ago. Yeah. Do you have a question, young man? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, have you watched Call My Agent? Or is that mm. too much of a question? No, 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 I think it's great. I'm very sad they haven't recommissioned the UK version, actually. Because John Morton, who's a brilliant writer, who did W1A and 2012, which were both masterpieces, I thought. Uh, was doing it, but you know, and I like the French version, I like the UK version, yeah, yeah, and uh, it's a bit more sort of the French one's a bit more about all the French actors, isn't it? you know. Whereas I tend to work with writer performers rather than actors, I mean, they quite often act, but it's a slightly different game because you have control over your own destiny. If you create your material part of that, you have much control, whereas if you're an actor for hire, you don't. You work with Tim Minchin, don't you? Yeah, yeah. So uh, Tim Minchin's a genius. Yeah. I went to see um, Groundhog Day last night. And, uh, I mean, you know, working with someone like Tim Minchin, he's the nicest guy on the planet, and he is just brilliant. The cleverness of these lyrics and music. And I, it's not even that... I, mean, I never really liked the movie, to the truth. And I don't really like the plot. But you couldn't help just stand up at the end and cheer. You know, it was brilliant. <laughs> I know, when I... When I go to the theatre, if I leave the theatre feeling blown away and simultaneously seething with jealousy, I know it's been a really good night because I, <laughs> yeah. I just think I, I could never have directed it with that vision or performed yeah, it in that way or written it in that way and I think that, to me that's always a good sign that something's been finished. Yeah, and then in success. every department, you know, and that's why I say this level of talent and I was involved with it, so working with Nick Heimer for instance, you know, the, the, the you see guys and dolls, I mean it's so brilliant. It is brilliant. Because the design and the acting and the singing and the, it's easy to take for granted, but we're really, really, really good at it. Much better than anywhere else in the world. You go see a Broadway show and they seem pretty old fashioned compared to what we've got on our doorstep. Guys and Dolls at the Bridge also has this incredible set which seems to just move and morph around and comes up and down. Yeah, it's, isn't it? yeah, it's definitely worth seeing. I think it's had its run extended, hasn't it? Any more questions for Peter? <laughs> Would you be prepared to say what's been your greatest surprise? For them? Did you think this has been a massive international success? Greatest? Transfer and Maybe you thought it would be a success, but it's just exceeded your expectations. Mr. B. Yeah, I mean, we always thought it stood a chance. Yeah. But I mean, it, 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 it's never been this popular, that popular in this country, so you probably don't really get the scale of it. But, you know, it's Facebook followers. The, the, the 140 million, I think, is not <laughs> exceeded only by Ronaldo, who's slipping, <laughs> and Facebook and Samsung themselves. So, he's, you know, as soon as we got Ronaldo out of the way, we're number one. <laughs> Over everything. Over Beyonce or, you know, any, any pop star. Any, Manchester United. <laughs> uh, and, uh, so, I love Liverpool Football Club. As well. And I got to sit next to Kenny Dalglish at the uh, Grand National this year. Oh, my God. I felt like a school child. <laughs> and uh, actually, it was just, obviously, I felt like a kid who got the candy. Maybe I'll... What's been your career in What would you say of the greatest? Oh, uh, Cumbria and Beef. And translation. Wales forever. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, yeah, like, I did one of those ancestry tests the other day. And uh, about her, I'd done it. I got my sister to do a family tree, and there seemed to be a bit of leakage in from Derbyshire in the uh, <laughs> 16th century for some deal with Elizabeth and the other Leicester. Anyway, pretty good 96% Welsh, 2% Irish, and 1% little trickle from England and Northern Europe. So, so that's good enough for me. <laughs> Peter, it's been a delight. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you for sharing all your story. Thank you.